Okay, I'm gonna answer some questions. I better do it now or else I probably won't do it. Sometimes I'm reliable and sometimes I'm, I just disappear I forget. So I wanna answer questions. So let's see, how to make punches. Well, you can start with a, a brow tine of a white tailed deer antler. The brow tine is the one who's closest to the main beam. Those generally tend to be a little bit harder. You can get little spike antlers and cut the main beams into sections, or you can just take your average tine like this and uh, traditional way to do it, probably be to get make a little saw like this with a flake. If you can wedge it in something, then you can use two hands and it makes it go quick. But this just took a couple, couple seconds to see what I can do with here just really fast. saw it down just saw it around that far snap it off and then you can just file it down I prefer them to be a little bit straighter than this or you can just take your bandsaw or grinder whatever you want to do now the outside of the antler right here and here sometimes those will want to flake off so I'll just grind those down a little bit this one is a narrower to get in a narrower notch there's all different shapes and sizes that work when they're long, think about it. If you're, oh, where's my other one? Like here's one of my stubby peg punches. Picture this being this long. Now imagine trying to direct the angle of the flick you want. If you're off, if the longer the punch is, the easier it is to get off on your angle because you're out here. So you have to be, and then you're, the shock that you have to remove the, the flake, all kinds of things can happen, so. Short ones, I work on uh, heavier bifaces or a tough chart, fine. The more loose support system you're is, the more your shoulder's higher because you'll be scrunching and you'll be biting on these shoulders. If you have this immobilized in something, then you'll find that you're using more the end of the punch. So I think I have videos where I use a, a palm, moose palm slotted holder that I wedge stuff. You can do some cool um, pattern flaking that way. Generally on the... Um, let's see if I can, if I lean forward, this video is going to flip to vertical. Um, where's my little paddle? Sorry, I didn't have this ready. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, if you're just going to work on the leg, I'm going to have to really lean back so this doesn't flip. Um... I, have, I like to start at the tip. Now these are not like raw chert thinning, thinning tools. These are just finishing edges and resharpening mostly, although you can get kind of crazy with them. So brush, brush, brush. See? I make little platforms, adjusting the edge with that. Brush, brush, brush. See that? There's a lot of point styles that I like to finish with these vertical punches. I won't get into all the details of that right now. Let's do one more right here. Oops. It's a little bit of a heavy bump. There we go. It does good for edge thinning and resharpening and boxing your stems, but on thinner bifaces, I like the horizontal punch. Why? Controlling inward. All the inward here is relying on these shoulders. I see people fluting Clovises, like making leather holders and using vertical punches to flute, and it's just a, it just, it, it's not, you're not taking advantage of the vertical punch doing that. You're kind of working against yourself. Okay, so that was that, how to make a punch. Um, the little notching punches are gonna seem really challenging. I'd like to have a couple different ones when I go into a notch. A broader, I'm not gonna notch this, I'm just gonna. Same working the shoulders. I'm gonna make a stem point, sort of get in. If you use too fine of a um, antler, then you're just gonna you're just gonna chip your, your tool. So get up, dull, dull, dull brush. Sometimes my punch will slap down. And then eventually you could switch, I don't know. I'm not even going to make probably much point of this. Maybe I will. So on charts like quartzites and on grainier charts, 
finishing with a vertical punch is sometimes helpful because um, you can get narrow and you can just do little, little resharpening flakes, just kind of walk up the edge. Let's say we've got this broken agate base and I broke pressure flaking it. Let's say you wanted to do um, just a little resharpening. Then you can just scrunch, 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 do a little flake, move over, you know, so on and so forth. Um, the di difference between bone and uh, bone billets, bone and antler are pretty similar. Obviously, bone's lighter and there's all kinds of varieties. And whether you're talking about pressure flakers, punches, or direct percussion tool, bone has a tendency to want to flake more, just like ivory, too. So everything's different. With walrus ivory, this outer enamel can get a little flaky and can cone. The inner stuff is more granule where it's solid. So you want to just wear that outside off or else you're just going to flake it um, with... Uh, like pig bones or other bones in general, don't boil them to clean them. Just if you have a big, huge, hungry bulldog, if you throw all the bones to the bulldog and then get the last ones, those are going to be the densest part of the bones. And something about dog saliva is, is a bone hardener, I'm convinced, although I can't prove that. Although I am going to Google some scientific research papers to see if I can get to the bottom of that, or else I'm not going to trust my own observations. Just kidding. Anyhow, so much of it you just kind of have to figure out because, like, antler bone varies a whole lot. Oh, sorry about talking so fast. Um, so you just have to find the stuff that's not weathered and then work with it. And if it's flaky, just kind of wear in a little bit. Like a manatee rib bone, that's a solid, huge bone. Those things work great, but it's basically like an antler, just a little bit different. A buffalo cannon bone or like that elk bone I was using the other day. They will just have a short shelf life, but they're the light weight forward. When you get them and they're just right and you've got a soft jasper, like a Republican River jasper or a soft shirt uh, or like something like Kay County or a soft Burlington or um, a, like a Hickston, you know, fine grained material like that. They do work wonderfully and it's light and you can, it's fun percussion tools. So, but how to quantify the nuance and how those behave and how to make recommendations based on perceived experience of another napper is really d difficult for me to say. So I'll just say mess with it and see how you like it. Um, let's see here. Um, copper and abo similar. Somebody made an observation about that. And this is, uh, I want to tread lightly because when I was learning abo napping, or if I would have seen myself, you know, when I was 15, 16, 17, working on you know, large moose antler on really tough rock and kind of struggling, and then you go to a nap and you see another guy you know, working giant, huge pieces of flint with big copper and he's knocking off big flakes. It kind of seems like, to a casual observer, that I would just be, have something to prove, maybe. Because one method copper is such a wonderful flint napping tool. I mean, if you did drop, went, you know, invented time travel and dropped a thousand copper nuggets off over central Texas, you'd probably find in 40, 50 years a lot of napping revolving around those, but... I like to approach it with common sense because eventually, right, I'd like to, maybe I'm not going to succeed, but I'd like to figure out how this stuff was done. So um, you can go all over the country and watch people flit napping and you're not going to hardly see anyone using antler tools or hammer stones or anything. It's just so much harder to do. And it's not, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back like I've achieved something for the sake of it that's, you know, like, haha, I'm a purist. I mean, that's nonsense. It's so much of the stuff that I've made that's hokey and wrong using traditional tools is, as you know, it doesn't give you, it can give you a, a leg up, but the, the investment in it, that's why I'm sharing stuff. Because if somebody would have taught me all the stuff that I've had to figure out in 30 years, I would be so much further than I am right now. The, undoubtedly, there's no doubt in my mind. So um, the amount of people that are going to use traditional tools is going to be very few. The amount of people that are using copper that say if they had it, they would have used it or it's the same. And then, you know, tell you a story about a conchoidal fracture and amount of copper pressure flakers found in woodland burials and you know a formal copper nugget they said they could have been used to make clovises or whatever their people will justify whatever they're doing to sell you their art or or to feel like they're because they are you're still flint napping it's still wonderful as a hobby should be enjoyed however you want to approach it there's no, nobody has to defend their position nobody has to you know say that they're doing it right and other people are doing it wrong that's you know everybody's fine with how they do it but 
when you get to the nitty pitty picky of replication and you look at old collections and you start looking at subtle signatures, like I made a comment of being able to identify copper punch flakes versus antler punch flakes. I can't. I couldn't describe it. I couldn't I couldn't do it based on photographs, but I've just had enough experience where I can subtly see the difference. And that's the case for a lot of other copper tools that kind of stick out. So my advice to learning knappers who want to get into, who like old artifacts in their area, they're intrigued by it, they, and they're really into it, is don't use copper and you try to work raw, raw chert because mo- almost all the flint napping is done is using raw chert. So if you can soak it and keep good quality raw charts hydrated, they work a lot better. And uh, try to avoid, eventually, I'm, you know, I'm 85, you'll probably see a meat on a napping with a copper pressure flaker and a magnifier and a four foot sun hat. And hopefully a dog as good as Rico. And I'll probably be sitting down there, just, you know, my elbow, my wrist will be toast and I want to flint napping, so I'll, I'll be doing that. But for right now, I'm just kind of not ready for it. So yeah, that was a diatribe. That Can you tell that I had half a banana and four cups of coffee? So sun came out. I made, I'll do another point show. I've been working on Indiana Hornstone lately, so I'll do that. And uh, I think I got to most of those questions. If I missed you, I'll try to do short videos on that in the future. It's probably better to demo than it is to just write, because it's so, I get all kinds of discombobulated when I try to read flint napping descriptions or things like that. So anyhow, hope everyone's got a good weekend, and we'll see you next time.